I'm Jamie Hazlett. I'm the Outreach and Communications Librarian at the William H. Hannon Library. And on behalf of the library and our program partner at the Department of Student Media, um, I'm really honored to welcome all of you uh, who came out on our equivalent of a blizzardy evening um, to, to hear the stories of journalist and author Betty Metzger and John and Bonnie Raines, who are two ordinary citizens um, who, along with six others, changed the course of U.S. history through an extraordinary act of courage and resistance. Um, the burglary of an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania in uh, 1971. Um, a few notes before we introduce the panelists. So first, if you can please silence your surveillance devices. Um, uh, we also, we plan to leave 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the program for questions at the end, so if you can please plan on holding your questions until then, we'd appreciate it. And then after the program ends, we are inviting all of you to join us for a reception um, out in the atrium, at which point we will also have books available for sale and signing by all three of our guests. Um, and we also would like to strongly encourage you to visit the um, Jessica Ferris and her colleagues from the American Civil Liberties Union. They've got a table outside as well. So um, I'll turn the mic over to my program partner, Tom Nelson, the director of student media at LMU, and he is going to introduce tonight's guest of honor. Thanks, Jamie. On behalf of the student media department and the library, Thank you to the Southern California American Civil Liberties Union and Dr. Robert M. Nelson, whose sponsorship has made this event possible, as well as events throughout the week at other colleges and universities in the Los Angeles area. And a special thank you again to Jamie and to library event specialist Carol Raby, who is out planning, oh, there she is, planning a reception. So I have to tell you that we've been planning this event for more than three months, and everything went perfectly. Too perfectly, in fact so that I knew something would happen, and two things happened. When I checked the weather last night, we got rain. So rain in Los Angeles, you know what that means. <laughs> and then uh, number two was when I woke up this morning and checked my email, I had an email from President Bertram, who has been battling the flu for the past 24 hours, and unfortunately can't be with us. So, <laughs> with the rain, and with President Bertram's illness, we had to uh, find a able, very able pinch hair, and we were able to do that with Professor Jessica Langlois, who is a professor of English in journalism here at Loyola Marymount University. She's one of three professors today who had our guests speak to their classes. Uh, and her enthusiasm for the topic and the research that she put in, into it made her, sorry to put it this way, Jessica, but a perfect plan B. She's not President <laughs> Bertram, <laughs> but she knows her stuff, so trust me on that one. And in addition to her teaching responsibilities at LMU, Professor Langlois, is a working journalist specializing in feminist issues and grassroots arts and political movements. Her essays and articles have appeared and are forthcoming in LA Weekly, Oakland Tribune, Pitch Magazine, East Bay Express, Los Angeles Review of Books, American Literary Review, The Rumpus, California Northern, and Traveler's Tales. Please join me in welcoming not only our panel, but our perfect plan B, <laughs> Professor Jessica Langlois. Thank you, Tom. So let's jump right in. In 1971, Bonnie and John, you and six others, broke into the regional FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, the same night as an epic fight between Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali, which was sort of a metaphor for the two opposing sides um, of American thought about the Vietnam War at the time, <coughs> stole all the files and delivered them to certain, after two weeks of looking through them, delivered them to certain government officials and members of the media. Betty, you were the first to publish the content of those files at the Washington Post, which revealed extensive and illegal spying and harassment the FBI had been committing, particularly against African Americans and political activists. In your book, you chronicle the lives of the burglars who were never caught and only recently revealed their identities and the incredible impact of the burglary. So before we hear all the stories about how this came to be and what's happened since, Betty, I'm hoping you could set the scene for us. 
of the political climate in the US around 1970, especially, especially for our younger audience members um, and students here today. So um, in the book, and, and particularly in a context that is not widely covered in history books, in the book, you say that it became clear in 1970 um, that a war against dissent was underway, specifically violence against students and anti-war activists, and also that courage was becoming visible in the actions of civil rights activists in the 1950s and 1960s. So can you tell me a little bit more about this um, war, secret war against dissent, or overt war against dissent, and, um, and the courage that was becoming visible? Thank you. Thanks to the ACLU and to uh, Loyola Marymount for inviting us and to all of you for coming because I understand that Angelinas aren't so enthusiastic about driving in the rain, so <laughs> we're grateful that you did. Um, 1970 was a, a time, and some of you uh, will remember this, that 1970 was a very discouraging time for people in the anti-war movement. Uh, many people have been working for nearly a decade by that time to stop the war in Vietnam. And we're deeply, deeply frustrated that uh, not only did the government seem to not take their pe petitions seriously, but that the war was getting worse. In fact, it was in that year, April of 1970, that, that Richard Nixon gave a speech one April night saying that we were, at that time, expanding the ground war and invading Cambodia. And by that, the next day, protests broke out all over this country as they never had before, including in small towns. And uh, people continued to feel uh, that, that it was a hopeless time, but they also continued nonviolent protests. But Bill Davidon, who was the leader of, of the group, and we deeply regret, died a year ago in November and is not with us to tell the tale. It was Bill who got the idea for the burglary. And the idea came out of this sense of, of hopelessness and also the fact that during that time he had started to hear from people in many different types of peace organizations, scientists, people who were uh, helping uh, people didn't want to enter the, the, the war, or didn't want to enter the military, uh, to not do so. Various types of people were telling him that they thought that uh, there were spies in the peace organization. They thought that the FBI had infiltrated peace organizations with informers. And although many activists who have been in the, in the civil rights movement and the peace movement felt very sure that this was the case, there wasn't any evidence, and the public adored J. Edgar Hoover. He had been the FBI director for nearly a half century. And so if Bill Davidon thought, you know, this is such a serious thing. It's not enough that people in various movements think it's true. We need evidence to prove that it's true. And we need evidence that, documentary evidence. And he knew that Congress had never investigated the FBI. Richard Nixon certainly wasn't going to investigate the FBI, nor was the Attorney General. And so he got the idea and then convinced his other people uh, that this was, uh, there were two wars going on then. There was the war against dissent, and there, were, there was the war in Vietnam. And it was important to stop both. And so he got the idea that maybe the only way you could get that documentary evidence was by breaking into an FBI office and being willing to risk your freedom for decades. And that's what he convinced seven other people to do. Now, your question about the courage, which this definitely uh, is related to. I mentioned in, in the book that Jessica said that there was, courage wasn't new. There was a, what they did, there weren't many people showing that kind of courage but courage had been in the air for uh, very visible to Americans in a new way for a decade. I think that up until this time, uh, the most prominent kind of courage, the courage we saw illustrated in public events and in public media, media were military people and athletes. But 
in the, in the decade be beginning in the late 50s, I think the key event was the uh, murder of Emmett Till. That, that so shook people and the civil rights movement began <coughs> in uh, intensity at that point. And from then on, as we moved through the civil rights movement and the many key uh, events that took place, Americans for the first time saw on their televisions at night in their own living rooms, people reacting with great courage, people sometimes risking their lives. And that was, that was a truly new image for people. And then they also saw it in some of the anti-war demonstrations and people turning in their, their draft cards and being willing to go to prison. So that's what I mean when I think that courage was, was in the air at that time. So that brings us to Bonnie and John, how you two ended up being an embodiment of that courage. Um, I know both of you were involved in um, civil rights movement in a number of ways for many years leading up to this event. And I, I, I hope you can take us through how you got to the point where, um, Bonnie, you went in disguise to case the joint, um, did the reconnaissance mission at the FBI, regional FBI office, um, a couple of weeks before the burglary, um, and how, John, you ended up nervously waiting in the getaway car for the files to be transferred to you and later photocopying many, many of them on the copy machine in your university and risking being discovered, all the while having three young children and knowing that your own security and liberty were at risk. How did you end up there? Well, um, for me, the story of 1971 uh, began uh, 10 years before 1961. Uh, when I would uh, begin a second education, I wasn't supposed to get. Uh, you can see I was born a white and male. Uh, and, uh, uh, what you can't see uh, was I was not only born white and male, but I was born into a family of very considerable class privilege. Uh, there were live-in maids, and I had a governess. Uh, I had all the private schools and all that kind of thing. Uh, I didn't ask for all that. I just woke up and that was the world I became. Uh, and that's what I want to begin. John Raines began as an accidental John Raines. And every person in this room began as an accidental you. Not one person in this room got to choose your gender. Not one person in this room got to choose your race. Not one person in this room got to choose your parents. Not one person in this room got to choose your genetic inheritance that would determine your body shape, the shape of your head, and the genes that would either protect you or open you to particular diseases. None of you got to choose the social world into which you would, would be born, or the time that would be your time to be alive in time. All of us began as an accidental self. And the task for each of us is how do we pass from an accidental self to an intentional self? And that's the story I will try to tell very briefly right now. The most important classroom I was ever in was a jail. That's where I really learned what the world looked like. Oh, I understood the world from the beginning. I mean, I looked out at the world, and the world was my cup of tea. Uh, uh, I was a privileged white boy. Uh, uh, the education I got was an education in a world where my kind lived in a very small bubble at the top. We lived in a world and we understood the world we lived in from top down. None of my teachers in those elite private schools and later the elite universities ever told us that we were living inside of a tiny bubble of privilege and power and understanding the world from top down when most of the people living in the world lived in the world from bottom up and understood that world from bottom up. That was why it was important for me to get arrested. I didn't know that at the time. In fact, it only dawned on me as the years kind of unwound and I began to try to figure out the puzzle of me. How did I become so different than I was supposed to be? We rode into Little Rock, Arkansas on a Trailways bus. 
on July 10, 1961. There were four of us, two blacks and two whites. They called us Freedom Riders. We got off the bus together. We went into the white waiting room together in Little Rock, Arkansas, in the Trailways bus station, and we sat down together. We were, the four of us, promptly arrested together. The charge was a threatened breach of the peace. Now that was a very good charge. We did want to threaten, we did want to be breached that unholy piece of legalized segregation. When the law becomes the instrument of injustice and the instrument of mass injuries to people, then the only way to stop that injury from continuing is to break the law and reveal its invidious intent. So we did that. The judge, quick lover, a guy like me, a white guy of class privilege, <laughs> took us into chambers and he said, I'm going to find you guilty, but I want, to, I want you to know why. Uh, if I don't find you guilty, I won't get reelected. <laughs> That's what he said. Wow! I mean, you know, back in Minneapolis, Minnesota, when I was growing up, the law was our law. The policemen were our policemen. The judges were all on our friends. The mayor played golf with my dad. Uh, there was nothing to worry about uh, the law. I found myself for the first time in my life this would change me in a place I had never been before, outside of privilege and power, regarded by power as the enemy of power. And power had the power to punish me for that, and power punished me. Power and the law would never look the same to me ever again. Slowly but surely, I was beginning to pass from that accidental privileged white boy into a self I was just then beginning to become. I learned what I learned what Martin Luther King faced. He faced a powerful, powerful man in Washington, D.C. who hated him. J. Edgar Hoover hated King. Thought King was a communist. <coughs> used every dirty trick he could do to break King and his reputation and to stop the civil rights movement and to return the, the streets of the South to the quiet of segregated life. We learned that J. Edgar Hoover was not only the most powerful man in Washington, he was the most cruel man in Washington, the most bigoted man in Washington, and he had the power to impose his own biases upon the rest of the country. He used every dirty trick, surveillance, informers, intimidations, assassinations, yes, literal assassinations, as well as character assassinations. And we knew when we came out of that civil rights movement, I was arrested in Little Rock in, in, in 61, 64, I was Mississippi Freedom Summer, 65, I was the Selma March. We knew that when we came to the anti-war movement, to the resistance movement, that Hoover would use all of his dirty tricks to try to stop us. But we had to get documentary evidence. I'll introduce my wife this way. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is the you, you know what? Oh, oh. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Here he is. Oh, a moment. <laughs> well, uh, you will find out when Bonnie tells you her part of the story that she, she cased the FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania. And uh, in retrospect, they realized they'd been cased. And they'd been cased by this young woman who represented herself to be a student at Swarthmore College interested in a future uh, in the FBI. <laughs> And Hoover shouted at the 200, 200 agents he sent out to find us, find me that woman. <laughs> there she is. So, Bonnie, um, do you have anything you want to add about how you came from your accidental self? 
to the person who um, Hoover was shouting to find, had 200 agents after? Sure, I had a, a very conventional upbringing in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I was not supposed to make my way to the civil rights movement, to New York City, to PS 108 in East Harlem, but I did. I made my way in that direction and uh, met John right after he was on the Freedom Ride in 1961. We were married in 1962. Uh, he returned to Union Theological Seminary and I was a student at City College of New York along with Bob. Bob knows we were there at the same time. <laughs> Um, but my, my consciousness was definitely rising with regard to the inequality in our country and injustice. And I was looking for a way to address those problems, not yet quite finding that way. Uh, we were very engaged in seeing that the Civil Rights Act passed, that the Voting Rights Act passed in the 60s. And then, uh, then we moved, we had two children in New York City when we were in graduate school, and then we moved to Philadelphia. And the war was raging by that time, this awful, awful war in Vietnam. And we joined along with thousands of people, Philadelphia was the center of protests against that war. Uh, we joined with other activists in those protests and uh, determined to have our voice be heard the first, uh, the first steps we took to try to end that war were draft resistance. And we <clears throat> joined with what was called the Catholic left, uh, the Berrigan brothers, some of you will recognize those names. And they called themselves the East Coast Conspiracy to Save Lives which was opposing the draft in civil disobedience. And so we joined with others to uh, break into draft boards in the middle of the night. We learned our burglary <coughs> skills from nuns and priests, largely. <laughs> uh, and we would successfully remove the draft files and burn them. And in those days, it was a paper system so that if you destroyed files, you might keep a few young men from being sent over to be cannon fodder in Vietnam. Uh, we were successful in that kind of an action. And we continued to protest the war in the ways that many of you in this room did. Rallies, marches, petitions, buses to Washington. Uh, we thought our voices would make a difference, but they didn't. We were not listened to. In fact, the war was becoming more and more horrific. And we learned that our government was lying to us about casualties, military and, and uh, civilian casualties. And we were hugely frustrated, hugely angry. I can speak for myself, I was very angry. You gotta look out when she's angry. <laughs> <laughs> And we knew what the FBI was trying to do to squash the peace movement and intimidate good people and deprive them of their constitutional rights. But we didn't know what we could do in the face of that reality until Bill Davidon, this wonderful physics professor, a genius, absolute genius, and a and leader in the anti-war movement and the anti-nuclear movement, proposed that in order to show what the FBI was in fact doing, that we had to get proof. And there was only one way we could do that. And that was to get our hands on their own documents and find incriminating evidence that then we would want to make available to the public. So we, we planned a way to do that. And it was to target a small FBI office in a suburb of Philadelphia media that was in an apartment building in this quiet little town and we began to strategize and plan, meticulous planning. We were very, very careful with seven other people and uh, we intended to find the right time to break into that office <clears throat> in the middle of the night and remove documents and make them public. So we did all of the necessary preparations for that action and finally, the last piece of it was for me to disguise myself as a Swarthmore student, interview the head of the office, 
and learned that there was no security in the office whatsoever, <laughs> nothing. It was like a business office. I could have been in the HR block office, and, you know, as a matter of fact. Um, no security measures, the file cabinets were not locked, and it was, uh, the doors were just ordinary doors that you would open with an apartment key, for example. So that was our go-ahead signal. We figured that we had all the, all the information we needed to do, do the action successfully, and we chose the night of March 8, 1971, because it was a huge world championship boxing match between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. And we thought that the residents in the apartments in that building would be listening to the fight that night and that the police would probably be somewhat distracted and maybe not as vigilant listening to the fight. And that was the night that we went in and successfully got into the office, four of us, removed every document, approximately 1,000 documents, and, uh, and left with them in, in suitcases in the trunk of our station wagon. <laughs> that had a, the, our little boy's teddy bear in the back of the station. <laughs> I love that image. Uh, so to, to wrap up this part of the story, that we were successful, we aroused no suspicion, and we took the documents to a safe farmhouse where we could spend several days sorting them and examining them, and it did not take very long to find that we had, uh, we had procured what we thought we would we had a pretty good hunch about it, but we really didn't know until we put our hands on certain documents that were incredibly shocking and incriminating and showed exactly what the FBI had been doing over many, many years. And uh, so we needed to take the next step in our plan, which was to photocopy the most incriminating documents and get them into the hands of people in the media and in Congress, we hoped, who would then get the truth out to the American public. And that was the, uh, that was the final step. We photocopied documents, sent them in various packets to two members of Congress, uh, George McGovern and Perrin Mitchell from Baltimore, uh, representative from Baltimore, and three newspapers, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. And uh, the two members of Congress turned the documents immediately back to the FBI. They said, this is a crime. We do not want to have anything to do with this, even though they realized the documents were very, very shocking. Uh, the Los Angeles Times, the person we sent them to at the Los Angeles Times never received them because someone in the mailroom intercepted them. Uh, and the... Uh, New York Times sent them back to the FBI, and the Washington Post then was the final place we hoped we would be, uh, be able to make a case that they should be, the story should be told. And Betty Metzger, whom we had known previously in Philadelphia when she was a reporter there, was the person that we sent the packet of documents to at the Washington Post. So, and I'm gonna stop there. Yeah, at this point, I think we're all dying to know what exactly was in those documents. <laughs> so, so Betty, you got these in your mailbox one morning, um, and you might have thrown it away if you hadn't seen the return address label and known that there had been a recent burglary from an FBI office. Um, you might have been the only person who actually got her hands on the documents and didn't immediately send them right back to the FBI because you weren't investigating the FBI as a journalist. You were covering the anti-war movement and, and um, religion at the time as a reporter, right? Uh, That's right. And so, um, so you looked through them and by the end of the day, um, you had a story written and it went to press the next day. So tell us a little bit about what was in these documents, what was revealed, um, about surveillance of African Americans, students. Um, what was the extent of this? Well, almost didn't get published. <laughs> um, when I arrived at, at work that, that Tuesday morning, I had this large manila envelope addressed to me and from Liberty Publications, Media, Pennsylvania, which of course I had never heard of or had anyone else, as far as I know. And, um, I started reading it, and there was a, the first uh, thing I read was a cover letter, and it was uh, addressed anonymously to the five people to whom the files had been sent. 
and it was from a group that called itself the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI. <laughs> and then they proceeded to say in the letter that what had happened <coughs> on the night of March 8th, that they had burglarized the media office, and since then they had been analyzing uh, the files that they had stolen, that they had stolen every file in the office, and analyzed them, and were now sending them out and hoped that I would see that they got the information got to the public. So I started to read, there were 14 files in that first set, the set would keep coming until sometime in May. And the first file that I read was one that was so shocking that it made me think that maybe I had a hoax in my hand. It was a file that instructed FBI agents to enhance the paranoia, and to behave in such a way that Americans would think there was an FBI agent behind every mailbox. And um, I thought it was strange that if, a, if an intelligence agency, a law enforcement agency, had that policy, the idea that they would reduce it to writing and have it in a file seemed kind of strange. Um, then uh, the next file that I read was one that documented uh, recent activities of FBI informers at, on the Swarthmore campus. And from that we learned that uh, FBI informers on the Swarthmore campus included a switchboard operator who listened to professors' calls, um, a postal a delivery person on, on the campus who opened mail and reported uh, back on content to the FBI, uh, a mid-level administrator on the campus, and some other workers. It also revealed that on that campus, every black student was under surveillance by the FBI and had a, a file that was continuously growing. And that subject matter really became, was the focus of a, of a number of the, of the files, the emphasis of the, of the FBI on the surveillance of, of black Americans. For instance, um, in that first set, there was a file that described a program in Philadelphia, but it also existed all over the country. A file that described the, the fact that the FBI had black communities under blanket surveillance, just general black population. We're not talking about people who were uh, suspects in crime, people who were believed to be potentially violent. For, for J. Edgar Hoover, uh, to be black was simply enough to come under suspicion of the FBI. To be black was to be considered dangerous. And so the, under this program, and it was specifically described where uh, blacks uh, should be surveilled. It was just about any place that the average person might go in their lives. The corner store, bars, restaurants, libraries, high school classrooms, college classrooms, churches, those were all listed, and also the types of people who should be hired uh, as informers, suggestions such as anybody who has as a professional responsibility to go into the black community, like bill collectors, people who deliver newspapers, people who deliver groceries. And also, the uh, strength of this, of this program was made clear by a description of uh, the fact that every agent in the country was required to hire at least one informer who reported to him on a constant basis on the activities of black people. And that was true except in Washington, D.C., where every agent was required to hire six informers who would report to him on a constant basis on the activities of, of black people. So when this came out, there was a very large public reaction. <clears throat> As John alluded to, J. Edgar Hoover was much beloved. And yes, there were activists in the various movements that had strong suspicion that the FBI was trying to suppress dissent and even engaged in dirty tricks, perhaps. But there was no evidence. And now they had found the evidence. So, there was a, a very um, strong culture of silence at that time about intelligence agencies. 
Um, there was no oversight of Congress, as I think we may have mentioned. Um, and there was no investigative reporting about the FBI, except Jack Nelson's a reporter at the LA Times whose letter was intercepted. Um, and because of that time, J. Edgar Hoover was trying to have Jack fired by, by the LA Times. But other than that, there was almost no reporting on intelligence agencies. And they were just given, intelligence agencies got a free pass. It was widely believed in, in official Washington, in journalism, and in the society at large, that intelligence agencies should be free to do whatever they want. Well, that attitude started changing that day. I mean, when those stories came out describing what was in the files, um, there were members of Congress who, for the first time, criticized J. Edgar Hoover and immediately called for an investigation of Hoover and the Bureau. And at the same time, uh, newspaper editorial writers at major papers all over the country, uh, places where there had been nothing but praise for Hoover until now, called for an investigation of the FBI. And um, that didn't take place. There was an uh, intense interest in making it happen until the, the files uh, stopped coming. And then we moved from there to the Pentagon Papers, which were a very big news at the time. The his secret history of the Vietnam War and all the reverberations from that regarding the charges of Daniel Ellsberg, uh, the, the uh, breaking in at his psychiatrist's office and the trial. And then Watergate became a preoccupation. So what the Burgers had done wasn't heard about very much, but uh, silently it was moving forward. Uh, another journalist, one year after the burglary, happened to be shown a copy of what turned out to be the most powerful file that they distributed. And it was a, a, a cover sheet uh, on, a, on an article that the FBI director liked. It, it was an article about how college administrators should bring professors and student protesters under control. And up at the upper right-hand corner of that file, in big block letters, was the term COINTELPRO, which stood for counterintelligence program. And none of us who received it knew what it was. There was no explanation. But uh, Carl Stern, this broadcast reporter, thought, that's a very strange term. I want to find out what it means. And there was a note at the bottom that suggested that uh, agents should distribute that article to college administrators, uh, hand it personally to friendly college administrators, meaning those who like the FBI, and uh, write and give it through anonymous letters uh, to unfriendly college administrators. And Carl thought, what in the world is the FBI doing writing anonymous letters? If we only knew, I mean, what we would, we would learn later about the use of anonymous letters and disinformation. But he then, uh, asked both the FBI and the Justice Department repeated times to show him the files that had been written by Hoover explaining what COINTELPRO was when he opened COINTELPRO. And they said no, that this would endanger national security. And uh, he then uh, sued. And he had uh, lack of success with that at first, but then finally, by the end of 1973, a federal judge ordered the FBI to hand over those papers. And that was a very important development. Once again, the power of the burglary was in play. As those papers revealed that this was a, a highly secretive FBI operation of dirty tricks and disinformation, uh, that it, it was harassment. It was not law enforcement and it was not intelligence gathering, but it was harassment that was designed to uh, destroy individuals and organizations uh, whose opinions Hoover disagreed with, who whom he had labeled subversive, which was a very wide range of definition uh, for Hoover. Subversive, uh, to, to be called a subversive by J. Edgar Hoover, you could do something as mild uh, as write a letter to the editor expressing an opinion at that time, say, uh, against the war. 
or it could be uh, someone who was a communist and then just everything in between. So when this came out, then shortly afterward, journalists applied to get the actual COINTELPRO files. And what the public discovered then was they're deeply surprising and deeply angry. Uh, John mentioned about what the FBI had done to Martin Luther King, and that's how we found out about that. Uh, files revealed that the FBI had tried to get Martin Luther, had surreptitiously tried to get Martin Luther King to commit suicide uh, just days before he was to go to Norway to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. And things even much worse <coughs> than that, as bad as, as that is, but also coaching witnesses, uh, FBI informers, to give false testimony that uh, can lead to false convictions, <coughs> including murder. Some of you here may remember the case of Geronimo Pratt, Los Angeles man who was falsely convicted on the basis of an informer's coach testimony that was, that was wrong. And he ended up sending, uh, spending 27 years in prison for a crime that he did not commit. And uh, in another case, um, Black Panther leader in, in Chicago, Fred Hampton, uh, was part of such a, such a program where the FBI informer uh, became acquaintances uh, with Fred Hampton and others in, in the Panther movement and uh, wrote a diagram, draw, drew a diagram of Fred Hampton's apartment, including his bedroom, and pointed to Fred's bed and what side of the bed Fred slept on. And that was given intentionally to a Chicago police shooter for the purpose of that shooter going in as he did and shooting Fred Hampton as he slept and another Panther who was in the apartment that night. So the, what we discovered as a result of the, of the, of the burglary by, uh, say, the middle of 1974, as these files were, were coming out, was just this vast array of, of, of things that ranged from what I call crude uh, to cruel. And I've just described some of the, the cruel things. And crude things um, involved eight uh, FBI informers injecting activist oranges with, with laxatives um, and hiring prostitutes uh, known to have venereal disease to seduce <coughs> activists. So this was really too much for the public and there were demands that something be done. And by uh, January 1975, both houses of Congress voted, as a matter of fact, the Senate voted 40 years ago tomorrow to conduct the first investigation, not only of the FBI, but of all intelligence agencies. And those hearings, one of the, the Senate committee was known as the Church Committee. Some of you may have, may have heard of that committee. And those hearings were held, most of them in public. And the, the public, again, learned uh, much about what its most powerful law enforcement agency and its intelligence agencies were doing. And a national consensus gradually formed during this time that never again uh, should intelligence agencies be unaccountable. And that also led to the change in the Freedom of Information Act that made it possible for people to actually be able to get FBI and other intelligence agency files. Oh, thank you. It's incredible. And that it does bring us to today, to today and um, it, and this question really any of you can address. Um, what parallels do we see today in terms of surveillance, um, suppression of dissent, and also um, the fates of whistleblowers and the acts of whistleblowers like Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning? How are those stories parallel your own stories, Bonnie and John? And are these, this is not just a history, something that ended, 40 years ago, but what what is still happening today? Yeah, I'll, I'll tackle that one. <laughs> we learned in the 1950s and 1960s that a nation that lets itself be governed by fear will quickly become a poorly governed nation. I'll say it again. We learned that a nation that lets itself be governed by fear will quickly become a poorly governed nation. 
That's what happened in the 1950s and 1960s. Why was, why was J. Edgar Hoover the most powerful man in Washington, you should ask? He was more powerful than presidents. He was more powerful than any senator. Not a single elected official in Washington dared to challenge, dared to challenge J. Edgar Hoover. Why? Because J. Edgar Hoover was not only the most powerful man in Washington, the most feared man in Washington, J. Edgar Hoover was the most honored man in Washington. How did he get that honor? We, the people, gave him that honor. The vast majority of Americans in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s looked at J. Edgar Hoover and taught him to be a marvelous patriot. Why? Because he told us what we should be afraid of. We should be afraid of the international communist conspiracy, the great red tide that was sweeping over the, sweeping over the whole world. Would, soon America would become a, a small island of, of freedom in a vast communist conspiracy ocean. That's what he said. We believed him. The vast majority of Americans believed him. We gave him his power because he told us what we should be afraid of, and we accepted what he said, he became our great protector. That was 1916. This is 2015. And we have once again become a nation ruled by fear. Back then it was a communist conspiracy. Today it's the terrorists. That's what gets NASA off the hook. That's what gets the FBI off the hook. That's what gets the CIA off the hook. That's what we are allowing them to do to us. Here's something worth thinking about. The terrorists and the anti-terrorists are two foxes tied together by the tail. They dance the same dance. They sing the same song. They both depend upon you being afraid that terrorists get their money from the oil sheiks by becoming successful terrorists in the minds of you. NASA, CIA, FBI get their huge chunk of, of the federal budget because they have persuaded us that they will protect us from this terrible new fear. Now here's something, and this will be, I'll sign off with this one. <laughs> I don't act like I'm afraid. I don't think anybody in this room acts as if you are afraid. I get up in the morning, I get on the bus, I go to work, without for one moment stopping to ask, well, is the bus driver a mass kidnapper in disguise? <laughs> of course not. That's an impossible overreach of suspicion. <coughs> I depend, you depend, upon the taking for granted safety we share in public spaces. We, the people, give to each other the gift. Every morning that awaits us when we leave our front door. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving me the gift of feeling safe. We, the people, provide the, the safety that we need, and we do it every day. Thank you for that gift you give to me. Eddie, do you want to speak a little bit more about um, how when you got this information, it almost didn't go to press? What stopped it? What made you decide to go there? And again, how that parallels with some of the other releases of information, kind of controversial releases of information that have happened recently. Um, after, I, after I read the, the file, the first thing I needed to do was to find out whether they were authentic. Uh, and that turned out to be very easy <laughs> to do because the FBI wanted to tell us that because they thought that uh, if they told us that they were authentic, we would then go with the culture of the time and think, oh no, that should not be published. And so they said they were authentic, it should not be published. Uh, but the Washington Post felt otherwise, I felt otherwise. Uh, it seemed clear that 
pretty important story about the most powerful law enforcement agency in the country and information that the <coughs> public had no idea about. And fortunately, the editor of, a, of the Washington Post, the executive editor, Ben Bradley, also thought that, as well as the, uh, the national editor, Ben Beck Dickian. Um, well, I, once I realized two editors uh, supported publication, I just thought we were moving toward publication, and I went back to my office, and I spent the afternoon writing the story. And because I've worked in Philadelphia so recently, I recognized some of the names, and so I was also talking with, with, with some people who were in the files. At any rate, um, when I handed in my story at six o'clock, um, I had a surprise. I was told that it would not be published. Um, and it was at that point that I learned that not everybody in the building uh, felt the same way that, that I did or that Ben Bradley did. Uh, and what had been going on first was that the Attorney General, uh, John Mitchell, was, uh, had been calling the two editors and also Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post, throughout the day, multiple times, to each person, uh, demanding that they not publish and saying that they would endanger, to do so would be to endanger national security and endanger lives. Now that, that very serious uh, claim became a mantra for, uh, that the Nixon administration and also subsequent administrations have said many times. But it's such a serious thing, and it's certainly something that you take seriously. Um, but fortunately, it was possible from reading the file to know that that, that was not possible. But uh, another part that I, I didn't realize until the end of the day, after I had written the story, was that Catherine Green did not want to publish, and that the legal counsel to the, to the Post also was urging that the story not be published. Um, and a couple things that probably help uh, provide context for, for understanding that is that this was the first time that a journalist had been, an American journalist, had been given secret government files by someone outside the government who had stolen them. Uh, in contrast, for example, to receiving them from an inside whistleblower. Although there, there weren't many whistleblowers uh, prior to that time, I mean inside whistleblowers either. So that was a factor that made them pause. And the other factor was that this was the first time that the Nixon administration pressed Catherine Graham not to publish a story. Just three months later, they would receive the Pentagon Papers from Daniel Ellsberg and be faced with the same kinds of demands from the Nixon administration. And uh, also, a year later, re on repeated instances regarding uh, Watergate stories. By 10 o'clock that night, uh, Ben Bradley had succeeded in convincing Catherine Graham that the story should be published. And they were published uh, the next day on the, the front page of the Washington Post and across the country in other newspapers that uh, subscribed to the, the Washington Post wire service. And then uh, even the newspapers, the two newspapers that had rejected the files, uh, right after we published our stories, then they started publishing them. And so did all organization, news organizations around the country. Uh, and I know one of your considerations was realizing that this was coming from an anonymous source that had been the result of the burglary, but the Washington Post decided that it was the information needed to get out there, exposing kind of the criminal acts the FBI was doing, um, even though this had come from a criminal act. So um, again, I just um, going to bring it back, um, Betty, if you don't mind talking about um, the information that's been leaked, was leaked in tw uh, 2013. Um, about the NSA spying, and um, and is it is what are the parallels there? Is it the same? Are those the same ethical questions coming up? And um, are there what what are the different dangers for whistleblowers um, and informants today that there were then? Well, I think John and Bonnie may have shared this feeling back in um, the summer of, of 2013, as I was sitting at my desk. Um, and working on the last chapters of the, of the book, 
and the news stories came out about the files. We didn't yet know for a few days who had released the files. Um, but we knew that, that these large volume of NSA files that is very truly mass surveillance of, of Americans and also citizens of allied countries. Um, one of the things that struck me was, first of all, that when the, when the book and the documentary film would come out, they would have company by another uh, person uh, risking his freedom uh, for, for decades in order to uh, provide Americans with information about how the intelligence agencies operate. And I think that was one of the most striking things to me, to think of the parallels about that, that these institutions that really are very hard to cover um, and require that journalists have access to inside whistleblowers normally, that um, in the lack of, of, of that situation, of having inside whistleblowers coming to journalists, here we were once again in a situation 40 some years later where the way that Americans were learning about uh, being under mass surveillance uh, by sort of out of what I think of as out of control intelligence agencies. They were, had to learn it from ordinary citizens, and I, they're not really ordinary people, but I think you know what I mean by ordinary people who were willing to risk uh, decades of, of, their, of their freedom in order for the public to get this information. And Snowden came out just a few days later identifying himself, unlike the the media burgers, he felt that if he didn't uh, identify himself, that the government was going to come down on his colleagues uh, in the search for who did release this information, and a good many people in the S NSA would suffer. So as he explained himself then openly as he identified himself, it really was a very parallel description of an act of nonviolent resistance. And also the opposite of what the, what the officials would say about him at the time, that he, he really had great concern about not endangering national security. And also, you've never read a file that he released that, that uh, hurt an individual. He was simply, he was gathering information over a three year period that he thought was in, in important information about inappropriate mass surveillance that may also actually be uh, not the best way uh, to find terrorists in, in, the, in the first place, maybe working against the efforts that NSA says that, that it's conducting. Um, he also sought out journalists that he, that he thought would vet the information carefully, um, as the media burglars did, and, um, and his, was, his information was quite enormous and uh, quite detailed, and so this was quite a task to ask of, of journalists, but he found two people, highly qualified, Laura Portress, uh, documentary filmmaker, and also a writer uh, in the years since for The Guardian, The Washington Post, and The New York Times, reporting on these files, but also Glenn Greenwald, who was, uh, had been writing for Salon on these issues for many years without the documentation, uh, but now with the documentation in hand, and also at the, at the time that they released for the, for the Guardian. So that same sense, they, the media burglars and he were driven by if the public only knew, and the only way that we can convince the public uh, is to give them documentary evidence. There's a, a very strong parallel. Here. I think there was one more element too, that, and that is we can say there was not the proper oversight that there should have been uh, back in 1971. People in Washington were not doing the job they were supposed to be doing. And um, we were look, looking exactly at what was really happening. Uh, and so there was not the oversight, there was a vacuum. And, and uh, there were two, two similar um, conditions where a government official, Hoover, for the FBI and the head of the NSA went before Congress and lied about what was really going on. We now know that the head of the NSA, when he was asked if NSA was spying on regular, ordinary civilians, said no. So those are two very striking and, and disturbing parallels. 
and we still know that there is not the oversight that there needs to be, and that Congress is not taking that responsibility today, so that we, we have a lot of work to do. We need a new yeah. public discussion about how much of our private life does government have a right to know about? What are the limits of what government can do to, trans <coughs> to transpose our private lives into public records, into judicial <coughs> public records? How much of our liberty must we give up in order to protect our security? John Adams, our second president, said something way back then that we need to hear today and once again. He said, people who would give up their liberty to gain security deserve neither. That's where we are. I think that's a good place to end it. <laughs>
all of you will begin to be moved to see if you can't make that happen, make those connections, and begin to work together around your common values and beliefs. You're going to hear from someone from the ACLU of, of uh, Southern California that has some very good ideas yeah. about specific things that can be done. Um, but I also would just say that um, not very many of us are going to have the kind of courage <laughs> that these people had. <laughs> but uh, we can at least be curious and ask questions and figure out, it doesn't matter uh, that we're all under surveillance. And if it matters, you know, what, what should I do about it? Just pay attention and ask a lot of questions and encourage other people to do those basic things. I think that there is a distinct lack of curiosity in many, many people that we could stimulate. I, I'm not afraid of what they know about me. I'm sure they know a great deal about me, including what I'm saying right now. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid of how I will change my behavior knowing that they are always looking over my shoulder. I'm afraid that they'll turn me into a tame citizen, a docile, sleeping citizen. That's what I'm really afraid of. And you should be too. Can I add an addendum onto that? Um, So while I think it is really important to find ways to act, I want to bring the conversation back a little bit to um, privilege and um, who has the ability to act and how we can use privilege to uplift others. Um, in 1973, Muhammad Ali said on the Black Public Affairs Television Show, Soul, that he never raided a draft office, never burned his draft card, and was still fine and put on probation for refusing to go to Vietnam. And in the book, Keith Forsyth, Forsyth um, who was one of the burglars, said, you know, as um, John had earlier, you can do anything you want in the United States if you wear a suit and tie um, and you're white. So I, I wonder if we can also have that conversation of how um, those of us who have class and race privilege can use that to, um, to um, oppose uh, injustice um, in the way that you have and really what, you know, um, it, how, how, if we can acknowledge kind of the differences in, in how people are able to be activists. And, um, yeah. I think we probably have time for one more question and then we can continue the conversation. Oh, uh, reception. Do you want me to answer your question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I can let somebody else speak to that. I kind of just wanted to make that Others point. In the audience yeah, may yeah. Have some ideas about that. Did you? No, not about that. When they ultimately decided to publish your story, was there any scuttlebutt you heard that because people so detested J. Edgar Hoover because he had so many files on powerful lawmakers that part of the rationale for publishing was to try to start poking a hole in his power? Um, we didn't know all of that. Yeah. We, the, the, what you just expressed, uh, he had all those files. That didn't become part of the common knowledge until after this, as a result of this, and we started learning more and more. That decision was a very difficult decision, uh, and it wasn't made on, on the basis of whether Kathleen Graham uh, thought, let's get J. Edgar Hoover, let's do something to J. Edgar Hoover's power, I'm sure that, uh, that she was following uh, reluctantly, uh, because she was afraid, um, she was reluctantly following Bradley's advice. This is important, that Americans have this information because it tells them something about a very powerful official who's having a big impact on their lives in a way they don't know anything about. I'm sure it was as straightforward. That. I hope that a lot of you are angry. You have a lot to be angry about. This nation is being stolen from us. You know that. <laughs> you know that the top 1% now owns 45% of all the wealth in this nation. You know that it's been a recovery of Wall Street and not of Main Street. 
you know that your vote is being swamped in an ocean of money. You know that your country is being taken out of your hands and put into the hands of the few. You know that we are vastly and quickly becoming a nation of a few people, by a few people, and for a few people. And you know that that's wrong. And you know that you want to change that. I would like to acknowledge something that happened today um, that points to something that should be of concern to us. Um, a CIA whistleblower, uh, Jeffrey Sterling, was convicted this afternoon in Washington. And he's the CIA agent uh, who was charged uh, several years ago. And you probably know more about the, the journalist who they were trying to get to uh, come and, and testify at the trial and refused to do so. Uh, James Risen from the New York Times, and that battle alone took uh, about seven years. Uh, and then the trial of Jeffrey Sterling just took place. And this symbolizes uh, a very big uh, uh, block to our learning what, what the government is doing. Uh, and it's really not extreme to say that there is a, a war against whistleblowers. And whistleblowers are the lifeblood of journalists and the public ability to get information from the most powerful and closed organ organizations. But this administration, there's whistleblower law that is supposed to protect federal employees, but uh, this administration, I regret to say, has um, charged more whistleblowers, taken them to court than all previous administrations combined. And there, this is also a, another thing about technology. The te technology is uh, a very threatening thing. The government is operating uh, something <coughs> called insider threat. And federal employees uh, in most agencies have been told that their, their email and, and their phone calls are being guarded very carefully for whether or not they're, they're talking to journalists makes it even very difficult for a journalist and a, and a whistleblower inside government, or even somebody who doesn't pretend to be a whistleblower and just wants to talk to a journalist, to even make an appointment uh, with someone. So this is a, a very heavy threat and almost makes it more likely that the only way that information can get out is if someone does something as, as drastic in a form of, of resistance as what Edward Snowden did. Right. All right. Well, I think that ends the official part of our program. Please join me in thanking Jessica. <laughs> and Thank you. Join us outside. Continue the conversation. Enjoy a glass of wine. Please visit the ACLU table.